Dear Dr. Maria Adel Karai and dear participants, very good afternoon. Welcome to NICE webinar on Belt and Road Initiative post COVID-19. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy and world free from conflict. We envision a world where source of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved and peace is advocated. China studies is one of, the, one of our major research center at NICE. China studies as a whole brings into perspective the rising powers mounting economic, military and diplomatic cloud that certainly has the aptitude to either overturn or sustain the current contemporary world order. The center broadly examines China's international strategic thinking and conduct, foreign and security policy, and the impact of domestic politics and economy on China's foreign relations. It further addresses China's emergence into the face of the world in flux, domestic politics, economy, society, culture, PLA, and Tibet Autonomous Region, and most importantly, her engagement with each of South Asian country. Belt and Road Initiative gets a special focus on the China studies. Hence, to talk on this very important topic, we have Dr. Maria Adele Karai. I had the opportunity to meet her at Shanghai. Dr. Maria Adele Karai is professor at New York University, Shanghai. She is a sinologist and political scientist with an interest in conceptual history and history of international law. She, has, she was a research associate as part of the China Law and Development Team at Oxford University. She is a recipient of a three-year Maria Curie Fellowship at the Lunev Center of Global Governance, a fellow at Harvard University Asia Center, and an associate research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asia Institute of Columbia University. Dr. Krai completed her PhD at the University of Hong Kong, where she was a scholar and a recipient of Hong Kong Government PhD Fellowship and the Award for Outstanding Research Postgraduate Student of 2015-16. She was a fellow at Columbia University's Italian Academy, Princeton, Harvard's China and the World Program, European University Institute of Florence, and New York University Law School. She has published various articles and books. She has authored the book called Sovereignty in China, a genealogy of a concept since 1984, since 1840, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2019. Uh, some of her publications include China's unilateral abrogation of the Sino-Belgian Treaty, a case, a case study of deviant transplantation uh, in Michael Ng and Chang, Chao Yun, Chinese legal reform and the global uh, legal order, adoption and adaptation, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2017. Learning Western Techniques of Empire, Republican China and the New Legal Framework for Managing Tibet in the Leiden Journal of International Law, 2017. And China's Malleable Sovereign, Sovereignty along the Belt and Road in, uh, Initiative, the case of a 99-year Chinese leader of Haman Tota Port in the New York University Journal of International Law and Politics in 2019. With the support of Harvard University Asia Center, she organized the conference Legal Pluralism in Asia and the Histories of International Law, and the result will be published in a volume under review by Cambridge University Press. Dr. Karai, you, you're welcome to our program, and thank you for your time. You'll have around 30 to 40 minutes for your initial remarks, which will be followed by questions and answers. We request all our participants to drop their questions in the Zoom chat or in the comment box below the Facebook Live. Dr. Karai, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Uh, of course, I would have preferred being there physically in Nepal where I've never been, but uh, hopefully uh, next time. And so I would like to share my uh, PowerPoint presentation. They, I, I think probably today I will not last 40 minutes. It will be a bit shorter and uh, I will, will leave more, more time for questions. Um, and so my presentation is about the Belt and Road Initiative and the post-pandemic world. And uh, first of all, I don't think we're yet in a post-pandemic world. Is our hope to be in a post-pandemic world, but we're still living through this uh, pandemic and uh, its uh, huge uh, effects on uh, uh, people's life, uh, uh, economics, uh, um, and, and, and the way we, we, we interact with each other. And uh, for some, um, this, uh, this, uh, this pandemic has been a, a sort of opportunity. Some people uh, um, got wealthier, but for many others, uh, it has been a, a devastating uh, event for most people probably. 
um, even more than the Great uh, uh, Depression. And for sure, something substantial has been changing uh, in the world that we live, we live in. And, uh, and probably the pandemic, as I, as, I, um, as I was saying in the concluding remarks, uh, exacerbated things and trends that were already present. Uh, but what about the Belt and Road Initiative, this uh, project that uh, uh, had the potential of changing the world order that was uh, led by China? How uh, has this initiative uh, been impacted by this uh, uh, pandemic? Uh, will it survive uh, this crisis? Uh, is it resilient and how uh, it will develop in, in the future? Uh, and so the overview, I'll just give you an overview of, uh, of my presentation. First, I will uh, briefly discuss uh, the Belt and Road Initiative in the pre-pandemic, and I will refer mostly to 2019. I will uh, briefly describe it, although you probably don't need it, as, as most of, of, of you already know what, what the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is about, or don't know because it's very um, ambivalent and not clear uh, at times. Uh, then I will discuss the effect of uh, the pandemic on the VRI. And I uh, identified the uh, uh, two key issues. Of course, there are many issues that one can focus on, but I will just uh, discuss the debt um, issue that has emerged, uh, in particular with African countries and Latin American countries. Uh, but also uh, we can see with the pandemic, the increased distrust uh, of uh, liberal de democracy, the liberal world toward China. Uh, and we saw a big transformation uh, uh, in the European Union and exacerbation also of uh, uh, US-China tensions. Uh, uh, that of course has also repercussion on the implementation of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and the concluding remarks, I will basically just address the, the question, is the Belt and Road resilience? Uh, how it will look like uh, in the future? What direction uh, it will take? Uh, and so um, here, the status of the pandemic, of, of the Belt and Road Initiative in uh, 2019 uh, pre-pandemic. So first of all, what is uh, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative? It's uh, an international cooperation initiative uh, that uh, um, uh, aims to advance global and regional connectivity. Uh, and uh, in order to do so, it uh, uh, put focus on uh, infrastructure investments um, that uh, are very much lacking uh, all over the world, in particular uh, Asia. Um, and it does so through investments, policy coordination, unimpeded trade, financial integration, and people-to-people -people bond. It was launched in 2013 by Xi Jinping, and it has become its uh, signature foreign policy. And uh, it's very much in line with China going global that started in the early 2000s, uh, but also you can see um, um, the legacy, if you want, of Xi Jinping opening up. Uh, and now it's China time for internationalizing. Uh, to go out uh, uh, with this uh, program of the Belt and Road, which is still um, quite unclear. And a lot of uh, um, projects uh, um, were, exist already before and they were uh, integrated in the Belt and Road Initiative. They were put under this, uh, this big logo. Um, and uh, if we look uh, at data provided by the uh, Chinese uh, uh, official website of the Belt and Road Initiative and also Merix, which is a great uh, uh, source. It's, it's a German think tank and great source uh, uh, of data uh, and, uh, and um, on, on, on China. Uh, so the good straight volume between China and countries and region of the Belt and Road Initiative in the period between 2013 and 2018 surpassed 6 trillion US dollar. Uh, and then also in the past six years, China has signed uh, many documents, 173 cooperation documents uh, with 125 uh, countries, including the developing and uh, uh, the de uh, developed countries, and also 29 uh, international uh, organizations. And it's interesting how China is pushing for partnerships uh, uh, in, uh, in these documents. It's very much partnership oriented, the Belt and Road Initiative. It's not really a legal document uh, and it's far from creating an alliance system similar to uh, the US and its, its allies. 
And um, if we look at where this money goes, uh, uh, two thirds of Chinese spending uh, on completed uh, BRI project went into energy sectors, uh, uh, 50 billion US dollars. Uh, then uh, second is transport project and uh, uh, digital uh, Silk Road. Um, and uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, um, has been perceived uh, um, with uh, both, uh, both positively and negatively. And uh, of course, from the China side, there's been uh, um, the, the, the positive aspect and the positive impact, uh, developing uh, impact on, on, uh, on countries has been uh, uh, emphasized. Um, and um, and the, the, there's uh, only basically successful stories of the Belt and Road Initiative. On the other side, we have uh, uh, the, uh, the US and uh, the EU as well, and even now African countries and other countries have been much more critical uh, that uh, describe the Belt and Road as a threat to uh, global governance uh, institutions, lib the liberal uh, international rule-based order, uh, an initiative that will promote authoritarianism, um, and that will, will will challenge again the liberal order. So this like this is the sort of battle of narratives. And, uh, and now let's come to the pandemic. So this was a picture uh, pretty much uh, before uh, the pandemic. It, it, it was quite successful, but also uh, it, it was a mixed kind of uh, uh, series of results uh, with the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And then uh, uh, the global uh, economic uh, um, basically contracted hugely with the pandemic and the outbreak of the virus, uh, which began in Wuhan, China, uh, has sickened more than 14 uh, million people, almost 15 million people. Uh, at least uh, 600,000 people have died uh, out of it. And the first uh, reported case of death happened in January uh, in Wuhan, uh, and the city was completely closed off. And the same thing as, this, as the virus spread and it was declared uh, a pandemic by the World Health Organization, uh, many countries uh, followed China uh, with very drastic uh, measure. And uh, we ended up in a great lockdown. And many, many countries are still in the great lockdown. We cannot travel, uh, borders are closed, uh, economic activities have basically uh, collapsed. And, um, and I think that the pandemic so far has impacted the nature, if you want, of globalization and the world we were accustomed to. Um, and all signs are pointing to a global economic crisis of proportion not seen uh, in decades. Um, the International Monetary Fund uh, uh, estimated that the global economy will shrink by 3% in 2020 a slowdown that is 30 times worse than what the world experienced in the financial crisis uh, of 2009. Um, then when, when the, the, the crisis uh, caused growth to shrink 0.1%. Uh, uh, and uh, if we look at China, of course, uh, also China has been affected dramatically by, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, where where the pandemic uh, uh, started, um, and the China economy shrank 6.8 percent in the first quarter uh, quarter this year, um, and is the first recorded contraction in more than 40 years, like meaningful contraction in 40 years. Official unemployment figures have risen to 6.2 percent, uh, but according to other independent research, the number is much higher and it's approximately uh, uh, 20%. And it is also quite significant that, that at the annual meeting of the Chinese People Political Consultative Conference, uh, Chinese annual economic growth targets uh, that every year have been set uh, for, for 40 years uh, um, have been uh, erased. Um, um, and, uh, and the focus instead of like a growth target uh, has been on stability and uh, poverty alleviation. And here you see, I mean, this is 2021. I think it's a very uh, optimistic uh, um, growth rate, 9.2%. 9.2%, I think it's, it's quite unlikely that it will be uh, like, like that. And uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the uh, pandemic. Uh, so, 
around 20%, uh, uh, so the, the, um, the Better Road Initiative, of course, is an international initiative that is tied to global e economy. And its construction and development is uh, certainly cannot uh, uh, be separated from uh, the international situation. Uh, it was affected by anti-epidemic measures such as travel bans, social isolation, restrictions uh, on the movement of people in almost any country, uh, the shutdown of the economies uh, that impacted the global industrial chain and supply chain, uh, and of course the Belt and Road Initiative. And many large projects of the Belt and Road has been temporarily suspended. So around 20%, uh, according to Xinhua, so Chinese data, uh, around 20% of the Baton Road Initiative project has been seriously affected by the pandemic, uh, with 40% having uh, little adverse impact and 30-40% some, somewhat affected. And this, I think, probably is uh, still optimistic. We don't have uh, um, uh, clear data yet on the on the impact. I think we will take uh, some more time to see uh, the, the 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 real effects of the pandemic. And uh, the value also of new construction contracts signed in Belt and Road Initiative countries has dropped uh, in the first half of 2020 compared with a 33% increase of last year. Uh, and there are also report, media reports uh, that indicate that, for instance, the construction of Colombo, um, uh, of Sri of Colombo Port in Sri Lanka, the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Railroad in Indonesia and project in the China-Pakistan economic corridor uh, and also the economic zone in Cambodia have already been delayed uh, and suspended as a result uh, of the crisis. So this is basically more the negative side, but then we also have a new project that uh, were signed in. So uh, we, we see how Chinese Foreign Ministry of IE announced uh, uh, during this, uh, uh, this past June uh, uh, Belt and Road International Cooperation Meeting, that 29 government-to-government -government cooperation agreement were signed, uh, raising the number to 200. Um, and also since January, China has signed new regional infrastructure projects uh, uh, across Asia. And here on the right, uh, the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit uh, was able to uh, to to uh, to show what what are these uh, projects? So we have Myanmar, Nigeria, Zambia, Turkey, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and this list is not uh, ex exhaustive. Um, and so let's look uh, at uh, the uh, investments, uh, how they've been affected. Uh, so. Um, there is uh, um, a slower uh, expansion of uh, Chinese investments and uh, there is this continuing trend of declining that already started in 2016 uh, when we had the peak of Chinese investments and China internationalization, China going out. And then for a series of, re of reasons, both internal like capital control, but also external, the increase, uh, increased tension with uh, the US, uh, the EU, um, this um, this uh, this uh, outbound investment have, have uh, decreased, and we see also the BRI investment in the first half of 2020 by sector, and energy continues to be the uh, the major sector where uh, where China invests, followed by transportation uh, and uh, uh, metals. Uh, and here, instead on, on the right side, we see BRI investment relative change. And so there's been a lot of change, a lot of fluctuations uh, already from 2014 in terms of investment. So there is, you know, and, and we can see a gradual uh, decline. Um, as for trade, uh, we see uh, a world uh, uh, fall uh, of, of trade. Um, and you know that you have different kind of scenario for how the future will look like. We have the, the most pessimistic one. Hopefully, will not uh, follow that red line. Um, uh, that uh, according to which it will decrease uh, uh, the trade, international trade will, will decrease uh, hugely. Uh, but if you look at China and BRI countries, uh, uh, the decrease uh, was relatively uh, little and. Um, and data over January, March indicates that the BRI activity remained quite resilient despite the collapse of the Chinese economy, as we saw uh, in the slides uh, before. 
uh, merchandise trade growth in January, March between China and BR BRI dropped only around 2%. Uh, percent. Uh, another uh, kind of transformation that we saw was like the uh, digital Silk Road. Uh, because, of course, with the pandemic, there was uh, a, a, an explosion, if you want, uh, in uh, um, uh, e-commerce, uh, um, internet use, uh, and countries that had a solid, uh, a dig solid, a solid digital infrastructure and internet uh, uh, were able to cope better with, uh, with the pandemic. And, um, uh, and the digital Silk Road seems also expanding, despite the uh, now the politicization uh, uh, after US ban on Huawei and now European Union is also rethinking its approach uh, to, uh, to Chinese uh, digital investment and digital Silk Road. Uh, but what it is uh, exactly this uh, uh, digital Silk Road is a series of um, uh, cables, network equipment, uh, uh, including 5G, uh, data, research center, smart city project, and large e-commerce and mobile payment uh, deals. Uh, um, and, um, and if you look at data, Chinese entities have provided more than 17 billion US dollar uh, for digital Silk Road project completed between 2013 and 2018. And the digital Silk Road is in line with uh, uh, Made in China 2025, which is uh, um, an industrial uh, strategy and, uh, and reflects Xi, Xi Jinping's aspiration for China to become uh, a next cyber uh, superpower. And uh, Beijing has, uh, has helped the international expansion of Chinese uh, tech giant with uh, policy support and also uh, big lines of uh, uh, cheap uh, credits. And on the one hand, of course, the digital Silk Road uh, is uh, beneficial for many countries that are still uh, behind in uh, digital infrastructure uh, development. And it has provided and it will provide probably internet access to more community in developing and emerging uh, economies. And for instance, if you look at Africa, uh, China, uh, Chinese digital infrastructure uh, financing uh, is, it has been so far the, the largest uh, and it's bigger than the combined funds from multilateral agencies, G7 nations and African countries themselves uh, in the period between 2015 and 2017. Um, on the other hand, if there are all these opportunities, of course, the digital Silk Road has created huge uh, concern among uh, the liberal world. Uh, in particular, China has been accused of spreading authoritarianism, like, uh, you know, through the digital Silk Road, uh, it will expand its surveillance system. Uh, and, and also it's, it's a source of concern because China will become really a cyber uh, superpower that will challenge the uh, dominance maybe of the US uh, and, and the EU. Uh, and now let's look at the uh, Silk Road, uh, the digital Silk Road and the pandemic. Uh, so if you look at data, the 5G, um, the 5G uh, expansion has been considered uh, critical to economic uh, recover. And this can be read in many China uh, policy paper. For instance, the Polybor Standing Committee called for an accelerating the construction of new infrastructures such as 5G network and data center this, this year, like a few months ago. Um, and uh, uh, supported by the government, Huawei has continued to push its 5G expansion strategy. Uh, and uh, we saw this year new agreements with Oman, Kenya, Indonesia, Tunisia, Maldives, uh, uh, there is also the first of, of the kind plan to build uh, a huge manufacturing plant in France, uh, in Europe. So this is, uh, we'll see whether uh, this will take place or not. I mean, it's all the concern for, uh, for China use of data and government interference. Uh, of course, the, so we, we see this expansion, if you want, of uh, the digital silk road, especially in the developing uh, and emerging economies. Uh, uh, but there is, uh, there continue to be a lot of diplomatic opposition, uh, U.S. opposition that uh, basically uh, banned completely uh, Huawei uh, and it's, 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 it uh, started a campaign against uh, uh, China uh, digital infrastructures uh, and Huawei uh, uh, with its allies. 
And also we saw a reverse uh, of UK position. UK originally allowed for Huawei, uh, but then uh, lately it reverted its decision and it also banned Huawei. And now uh, many European countries are rethinking their, 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 their relationship with, with, uh, with this company and China Digital uh, Silk Road. Another uh, expansion that happened with the pandemic uh, was uh, the health uh, Silk Road. Um, the health Silk Road is not, is not something new. <laughs> it was first launched in 2017 uh, when Xi Jinping first used the term in Geneva where uh, China signed a memorandum of understanding with the World Health Organization committing to the construction of a health silk road for improving public health uh, uh, along uh, on countries along the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And uh, the health silk road has been considered as an extension of China so-called mass diplomacy uh, that will provide medical assistance to BRI participating countries via donation, consultation, but also uh, commercial uh, exports. And, uh, and this has been seen uh, uh, as a way to expand China soft power internationally. And this has had a mixed uh, uh, result. I'm working now with some students on an article on, on China mass diplomacy, the effects uh, how uh, and this health silk road. And uh, uh, as we will see later, I think it was probably too aggressive in, in pushing its own narratives. And so, it uh, backfired uh, China attempts to promote its uh, soft power uh, to a certain extent. And so this has been like basically like the general trend. And so the opportunity is probably that was the creation of this health Silk Road and the digital Silk Road. Uh, but then I see two uh, main challenges ahead for the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, one is a debt trap. Um, uh, that uh, for the past year, the main discussion around China's lending have been focused on alleged uh, debt trap diplomacy. Um, you know, you have all this money that go abroad for, for, for financing this uh, infrastructure project. This money have to return at a certain point. And uh, the fact that these economies now are in, in uh, distress, uh, uh, it also affects their capacity to repay uh, China. However, studies uh, that have looked at uh, the debt trap, I think it's, um, there's no, uh, no evidence that support uh, a China intent to, to put these uh, this countries in, in, a, in a debt trap. And uh, a particular interesting, so here we see like China Belt and Road loans have gone mainly to high risk countries. Uh, and of course this increased the, um, the risk of these countries not paying back uh, uh, the loans. Uh, and one interesting uh, case is Africa. Uh, African nations owe China 145 billions and, uh, and China holds uh, uh, almost between 17 to 24% of Africa external debt. Um, and here it should be considered that uh, the, the largest part of the debt of African countries is held uh, toward uh, it's it's toward private the private sector, not toward uh, uh, China. So this is a, is a misconception that we often have. Or China holds like all the debt of Africa. Actually, is not true. It's a private sector that holds uh, uh, this debt. But China, of course, uh, uh, has increased dramatically its loans uh, toward uh, Africa, and uh, it's a uh, it holds a huge chunk uh, of it. And if you look at case by case, there's like also great variation among sectors and uh, also the countries, uh, the kind of debt that countries uh, have toward China, uh, what percentage of their GDP uh, corresponds. Uh, but we see also here a, an increase of loans in 2016. And after 2016, we see a decrease and probably with the pandemic, uh, uh, also the loan uh, will, will be affected. And we don't know whether Chinese banks will be uh, capable of, of giving loans or whether the countries that are already in economic difficulties will be willing to accept uh, uh, loans. And China has received, uh, so how China will cope and the Belt and Road Initiative project will, 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 uh, will be affected by, by this loan uh, crisis. Uh, uh, so China has received a wave of applications uh, for debt relief from crisis hit countries. Uh, uh, included in the Belt and Road Initiative as coronavirus has uh, uh, damaged their economies. 
And a number of responses have been discussed among Chinese uh, uh, politicians in the Beijing. Uh, and China has indicated some willingness to offer debt relief program to certain low income countries. The Chinese government is also contributing to IMF catastrophe containment and relief trust uh, to support debt service relief for the poorest countries. Uh, moreover, China as part of G20 uh, took part to eight month debt memorandum agreed for poor countries. And this is quite uh, unusual, it's a, new, um, uh, it's a new kind of trend for China. It never happened before. Uh, China Development Bank, moreover, which is uh, one of the major banks together, uh, together with China Import Export, Export Bank that finance the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, um, has pledged support to co coronavirus hit countries, uh, including low cost financing terms and special loans uh, for overseas infrastructure projects. However, I think, and it's clear from the documents uh, that uh, all this Chinese government and also these banks have warned against expectation that China would forgive uh, that uh, completely. Uh, and so here we see uh, Xi Jinping's speech uh, at the uh, extraordinary summit uh, uh, between China and Africa on solidarity against COVID-19. And where also there's this uh, uh, favorable terms toward uh, um, toward Africa in terms of renegotiating uh, debt uh, and working together, like all these nice uh, words. However, uh, the issue is that, again, this debt has to be uh, paid back. Uh, and if you look at what China has done, sometimes it has forgive debt, but also uh, we saw uh, debt for equity uh, swaps and also uh, issues for, for, for sovereignty, uh, for, for, for assets of uh, sovereign states. And uh, more recently um, in Nigeria, it was very much discussed and debated on media, uh, the close of, uh, of a loan agreement for financing a railroad, uh, where we read the borrower uh, Herbert irrevocably waives any immunity on the ground of sovereignty or otherwise for itself or its property in connection with any arbitration proceed, uh, proceeding. So, here we see how China might uh, threat, threaten the, the sovereignty, if you want, of, of Nigeria. It already happened in Kenya or Zambia, uh, where China has taken over uh, their national power corporation and the broadcasting corporation due to uh, loan default. And also just recently in, in uh, Laos, China, uh, Laos was able to pay back uh, uh, a loan uh, on uh, a, a power electricity power power plant, and then uh, a joint venture was created with Laos uh, to so that China will manage uh, the the electricity the nationwide electricity um, uh, electrical power, and so this would be unconceivable in China. Uh, you know that you have a foreign uh, company or a joint venture that actually has control over. A very important asset. And this, of course, the debt for equity swaps, like is a very, uh, it's a big source of concern. Uh, although I, I, I think again, that there's no evidence that China is uh, plotting beforehand to uh, put these countries in debt distress and so that it will be able to, uh, to take assets. Uh, it's, it, it's more probably mismanagement and now COVID things that are force majeure that were not really uh, planned uh, before. And another uh, big challenge for uh, the BRI going forward that has, uh, has been exacerbated with, uh, with the pandemic is a competition, of course, with the US that I'm not uh, uh, discussing here. Uh, we can have uh, um, uh, questions uh, later, uh, but also with European Union. That was a big transformation that already started in 2019. When, China, when the European Union for the first time defined China as a um, systemic rival that promote alternative forms of uh, uh, governance. And uh, I think that there is uh, more and more um, uh, the awareness uh, in Europe uh, uh, that China is a great power and that uh, uh, you, the EU needs a proper strategy and in particular needs to avoid the over-dependency on, on China. And the pandemic made this clear because it showed the vulnerability of the supply chain. The fact that like for masks, we weren't uh, autonomous. We have to rely on Chinese imports of medical devices, et cetera. So I think this will also 
um, promote uh, uh, more independence, if you want, in the uh, supply chain. But also uh, because of uh, Made in China 2025 and the aspiration of China to become uh, this great uh, uh, techno, uh, technology, IT, artificial intelligence power, uh, now China is really competing in uh, vital sectors of the economy of both the US uh, and uh, the EU. And until China was producing toys or like cheap t-shirts was, was fine. But now I think that the competition has really uh, kind of escalated and um, and touch upon like very important uh, economic sectors. So the EU also wants to protect its own assets. Uh, and also uh, we saw during the pandemic how um, the, uh, the mass diplomacy had the uh, opposite effect, as I mentioned before. And the EU uh, high representative Borrell uh, said that China is aggressively pushing the message that unlike the US, it is a responsible and reliable partner, and it is a battle of narrative that was not well received uh, in the EU and created increased suspicion uh, toward China. Um, and after this pandemic, uh, I think that there was a mixed perception of China, uh, but I think there is an increase of uh, uh, distrust uh, that can be seen also in the renegotiation of some Huawei deals and the ban, for instance, from uh, uh, the UK, but Italy now, for instance, is rethinking uh, uh, its uh, cooperation and it, the, the presence of this company in, in uh, the country. And there's definitely the need for creating this uh, comprehensive uh, strategy. And so the last slide uh, uh, conclusion, um, the main takeaways, if you want, uh, from, from uh, this presentation is that uh, uh, there were many trends uh, that the pandemic has exacerbated. Uh, so for instance, the decrease of investment that we saw before. So we reached the peak in 2016, uh, but already uh, in, uh, before the pandemic, there was uh, a downward uh, trend uh, for investments. Um, China has also been rethinking about uh, uh, its internationalization and its Belt and Road Initiative projects. Uh, and it has become much more prudent and uh, uh, probably after the pandemic more aware of international politics. So in uh, Chinese investors like going to Africa or other countries, they have to keep in mind uh, all this uh, uh, political and geopolitical dynamics uh, that reverberates uh, uh, into their investment uh, uh, plans. And also another trend that was there that um, in, um, concurred to this uh, uh, politicization, if you want, of the Belt and Road Initiative is a tension uh, and distrust uh, uh, of the liberal world toward uh, China. Uh, and we saw how the EU has becoming much, uh, much more concerned. Um, and the debt also, we see the debt that probably it's, it's the Chinese uh, loans are going to probably decrease in the next year uh, on one hand because Chinese state bank will be reluctant to offer more loans to BRI country, uh, but also because host country that will be in economic distress that will be less willing to um, growing their budget deficits. But this uh, is not necessarily a negative uh, thing because uh, uh, the, the, the steps might be taken to avoid overcapacity and wasteful spending. Uh, that will help increase the sustainability uh, of credit-based infrastructure along the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but also it might address, for instance, uh, uh, environmental sustainability, good governance standards. Uh, and uh, I think uh, probably the, the trend for the Belt and Road Initiative, it started at this big uh, uh, label uh, that includes many different things, uh, uh, very ambiguous, ambivalent, and that was probably its strength because it can never fail but uh, probably with time it will become more programmatic uh, and so we will see an increase of law policies guidelines uh, uh, and regulations um, that will uh, direct uh, the development of the belt and road initiative and this is something that we've already seen uh, um, in, uh, in, uh, in in the, the guidelines uh, on the belt and road initiative and uh, to conclude, I think that there are many challenges ahead for the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, but I think the Belt and Road Initiative is here uh, to stay um, in, in a world that will become more politicized uh, and many has indicated a sort of Cold War scenario. Um, and, uh, 
and it would be modified, but I think it's it's a it, it's it's going to, to stay. And I think with, with this, I end uh, my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karai. Thank you very much for your comprehensive and wonderful presentation. You have touched upon almost all the major aspects of BRI. We have got lots of questions on similar lines. So let me move to the question and answer without wasting much time. Uh, the first question is, is it, it is often said that Sri Lanka has been fallen into death trap after the Hamun Tota port. Uh, you have worked on it. So what is your take on it? You briefly have also answered it, but maybe if you'd like to add something more. Yeah. So uh, Ambantota actually has been the main case used uh, to, uh, to, to support the narrative and the rhetoric of China debt trap diplomacy. Uh, and basically, was uh, Ch China has invested uh, um, uh, hugely in Sri Lanka for an airport, uh, the, the port of Ambantota, Colombo port. Uh, uh, and Sri Lanka was indebted um, and wasn't able to repay uh, its debt. Uh, and then China took, took over, basically created, similar to Laos, a joint venture to manage uh, um, the, the port. Uh, and, uh, and this, of course, uh, I mean, if you look at the, the agreement is not available, so there isn't really much transparency, uh, but um, it's not, uh, the, uh, the Sri Lanka government is still, uh, preserve control, the ultimate control, for instance, also in military terms uh, um, and, uh, and also in terms of development, what China can do there to develop uh, uh, the, the, the port. Uh, um, that said, I think was something from which China had, had learned. And I don't think, like I did a study on that. There is an article that I wrote, uh, I think two, two years ago or something, uh, uh, that um, there is no evidence also here that China was plotting to put uh, uh, Sri Lanka in debt distress. Uh, I think it was just uh, a lack of knowledge of uh, Sri Lankan situation, uh, optimism, and also the fact that uh, China does not impose uh, uh, conditionalities. Uh, that probably was kind of harmful. And now it's revising this. So, so now China is really trying to make projects that are more sustainable economically, uh, financially and also environmentally, um, and uh, it's it's in it's it's it itself in a learning curve. Um, but yeah, I don't think that 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 was was the key example of debt trap. But I don't think it was a thought of, uh, from China as a debt trap to put uh, Sri Lanka in a debt trap, also because it has such a negative effect uh, in terms of reputation. So I, I don't think that was was the case. Yeah, it was mismanagement and lack of knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Second is why is China investing more in uh, more resources on energy related projects. What are the reason and motives behind it? For energy sectors? Yes. Um, so I think that uh, this is to address uh, uh, one uh, uh, deficiencies of many countries. Like if you go to Africa, you don't even have uh, electricity in countries like Nigeria. Electricity is uh, is not uh, um, is not reliable, um, and I, there is also a lot of uh, um, um, overcapacity. Like there, China has all this has acquired all this expertise, uh, uh, and now it needs to uh, to um, to use this overcapacity that it has uh, 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 abroad. The same is for for infrastructures, and I think it also follows its uh, development logic that you first need. Uh, um, hardcore infrastructures and the, the energy plants and the infrastructure plants was uh, hand in hand. So there is a, it's, it's a, a more of an organic uh, development. One of the issues with uh, uh, China uh, energy um, development is often uh, it's um, uh, built uh, coal power plant, which are highly uh, pollutant. And this uh, is slowly being addressed, but it's still Still building that, and this uh, should, should gradually change. Uh, if uh, you know, if uh, it uh, it uh, defines itself as a as a leader in uh, in a green uh, a green development. Uh, there's another question which you have uh, answered, I think, uh, during the presentation. Uh, it, uh, like it was in the news that UK is comfortable with China's BRI, and it had, it had it had accepted Huawei 5G program, but. Uh, with the current situation, things are changing, like the UK has been changing its position. So what is the fate of BRI projects in UK and Europe? 
what is it what is the future of vri projects in in united kingdom and europe european union okay so the vri has many different aspects and is is investment and uk was one of the main recipients of chinese investments so merger acquisition and other other kinds so it's not just digital it's not just huawei huawei is part of the digital uh, silk road um and uh, I think it, it will be more challenged because the European Union has toughened, uh, has hardened its line toward China. It created now this uh, uh, European Union common screening uh, mechanism of uh, foreign direct investments that uh, aims at uh, possibly reducing this uh, Chinese investment or having more control, screen them. Um, and uh, it's the problem with Europe is that there is not, uh, there is a lack of unity among countries. So you have the European Union that maybe goes one direction, but then each country does its own interest, especially when it comes to, to economics, trade, investments. And in Europe, you have also these 17 plus one mechanisms of Central and Eastern European countries uh, that are much, uh, they're very, very interested in Chinese, in, in Chinese investments. And so I think uh, uh, it will be uh, debatable how, uh, and it, it probably there will be much variation on uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, future uh, in Europe, because some countries are much more needy uh, of, uh, of uh, investments than others. Uh, and, uh, and again, one thing is what the European Union says, and then you have the sovereignty of each, uh, uh, each member state uh, that uh, eventually decides in, himself, uh, itself what, what to do with, uh, with Chinese investments. So it, it really depends. Uh, uh, there's been a hardening of lines, but uh, uh, it's, uh, every country will, will decide basically what to do. Uh, there's another question by a journalist from Nepal, Kamal Dev Vatrai. He asks, due to shrinking economy, China may itself not be in position to give loans for new projects. Do you think it will affect those countries which are its selected projects because China may not be in position to provide loans as demanded by those countries? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly uh, a lot of uh, countries will, 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 will not get uh, uh, the loans uh, with the facility of uh, pre-pandemic, but even before, because as I said, uh, uh, the Chinese government has started to put in place uh, uh, guidelines uh, and regulations for the disbursements of this loan that banks need to follow and also entrepreneurs uh, uh, going abroad. So countries will definitely be affected by, um, by the fact that China will not be able to give uh, as many loans uh, and before, but, but maybe for the better, because as I said, probably the fact that uh, uh, there is a, a uh, limited resources now that China can can spend. It, it, it doesn't have the capacity it, it, it had before. Uh, this might lead China to be much more selective and, you know, select projects that are uh, economically, uh, environmentally, socially feasible, uh, rather than just giving money out. Uh, uh, and so this uh, might be eventually better. So project like, you know, a country that wanted to, to do a project that didn't make much sense was maybe a, a white elephant project uh, will not now have the, the money, the, the uh, line uh, the, of credit from, from China to do it. So uh, maybe for the better. <laughs> uh, another question is also there, I've sent it in your, back, um, in your chat box. Can China's BRI create the mutual economic boom it started out for in the context of post pandemic wall order. If not, in your opinion, is it safer for countries to back out of it, keeping in mind the economic impact of the pandemic for, or for them to keep looking at, to China for economic and infrastructure support? So, um, and here, here I think uh, this is partly to do with the China model. So I think uh, China was able to create uh, an eco economic boom within itself because there were a series of uh, uh, circumstances that uh, uh, that allowed it. And uh, I don't think this is exportable necessarily abroad. Uh, uh, there are some elements that can contribute to uh, economic development of other countries, but then it, uh, the, 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 this economic boom rests very much on each single country situation, uh, capacity to negotiate and uh, take advantage of uh, the money that come from China uh, and even the uh, development model or guidelines that, that come uh, or examples that come from China. 
And even if China will not be able to, uh, to promote, uh, to create this mutual economic boom that it did, uh, it promoted on itself uh, uh, since Deng Xiaoping, I still think that it's worth uh, for, uh, for countries to, um, <clears throat> to not back out from, from China or the Belt and Road Initiative, but to be part of it. Also because the Belt and Road Initiative is co-shaped is led by China, but is co-shaped by other countries. And uh, the more research is done, the more it's evident how China adapts uh, to, the, uh, to the situation and the context of, of different countries, uh, given, of course, the asymmetry of power, that that, that cannot be erased. Uh, but countries, even small countries, are able to negotiate. And most importantly, I think uh, that China brings options. Uh, and brings also leverage uh, for negotiations with the US or other donors uh, or, or other investors. So I think it's, it's very good to keep China in, just to have options and, and uh, uh, possibility to choose uh, among different investors. And uh, another question of what would be the impact of growing tension between China and India, India and US, and the tension with European countries on BRI projects? Uh, can you, this is also in the, can, no, no, can you, you also uh, um, put it there? Indian China. Yeah, I mean, so this is what I, what I said that uh, one of the biggest challenges ahead. So the one, one of the most evident is the debt, the capacity of countries to, to pay back the loans. But the other big challenges is the geopolitical context within which uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is unfolding. Uh, and in particular, the, the increased tension with the US, with the EU, uh, and also India. Uh, this will all play a role. So for instance, also Nepal is, uh, is, uh, is in between uh, uh, India and China. Now India is trying to, uh, to attract uh, uh, Nepal on its, uh, under its own uh, spheres and China on, on, on the other side. Uh, and of course, even if you look at uh, US uh, uh, campaign against Huawei, uh, that probably it, it might be able to persuade some of the, the allies, the US allies, to join the US, I don't know, against Huawei or against, uh, against China in, in other terms. Um, and uh, <clears throat> how this will, will affect... Uh, uh, so one thing that I would like to say is that uh, I, many people talk about Cold War scenario, uh, but I think uh, uh, there is still... Um, a difference in terms of countries that they can choose uh, between, uh, it, it, actually they don't have to choose, but they can, uh, they have options uh, and it's good to keep uh, in, in the middle. So um, yeah, uh, but I, it will definitely play out. I don't know how exactly all this, uh, this increased tensions uh, between US, uh, uh, EU and India. Uh, there's another question which I've also put it in your chat box, like will US-China trade war affect on China's BRI project and Indo-Pacific strategies? Of course, yeah, definitely it will, um, the US-China trade war, and is, is even more than a trade war, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an existential kind of war between the US uh, and uh, China, you know, that has to do now with values increasingly, uh, it's a full round kind of, uh, uh, war and uh, it will affect the Belt and Road Initiative project because uh, it will it will try to um, to bring countries. The U.S. will try to bring countries under their own sphere of influence, uh, or we see even how uh, now the U.K. or, or uh, the the EU uh, EU countries and the U.S. now they start to be interested again in Africa. Uh, so it can have both positive and negative effects. And, uh, and also the Indo-Pacific strategies. Uh, so now that uh, the EU, for instance, has to develop a more comprehensive strategy toward China, the EU started the, for the first time to discuss uh, its own Indo-Pacific strategy. So the Indo-Pacific probably will gain more and more importance uh, due to uh, the US focus uh, on the, on the, on the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Uh, yeah. There is another question, uh, like how do you look at BRI project in Australia? Is Indo-Pacific strategy going to impact China's BRI and how? Yeah, 
I don't know much uh, about uh, Australia. Uh, uh, this I, I, I um, uh, second yeah, is on, uh, the second is on Australia. Uh, sorry, uh, it's on Africa. I'm putting it here. Uh, like, are African countries really falling into the trap of China? How China presumes the loan to be repaid? So again, is uh, they, they have uh, big issues repaying uh, uh, the debt, especially now with the pandemic. Uh, I don't think that that is a trap necessarily. And again, it wasn't plotted probably by, by Chinese central government. Uh, and uh, I think when China goes in, uh, uh, so you see also transformation, a learning curve of China uh, in Africa. Uh, I studied the, 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 the both Kenya and Ethiopia railroads uh, financed by China. And you see how, for instance, the Exim Bank that financed the project have become so much more prudent in giving money away. Uh, because again, for Ch China was the first time kind of going out uh, uh, and is the first time China also has such a scrutiny, international scrutiny. And so it wants to, it wants the, the, the loan to become more and more uh, sustainable, financially, economically sustainable. Uh, when, it, when it started giving this money, I think it was, uh, it was more uh, unaware of the local situation. Uh, but I think things are changing uh, gradually. And also another element that uh, people often forget is how uh, China is, is a very complex entity, it's not a monolith. Uh, and uh, there is often a lack of control of, um, of its own uh, um, uh, companies going abroad. So there isn't really uh, the central government that uh, uh, dictates top down uh, uh, what to do in Africa. It's, it's a very complex, uh, a very nuanced uh, uh, situation. Only recently they started to put all these guidelines in place, but then again, there is a gap always between law, written law, written guidelines, written regulations, and the reality, the, the very complex reality. Um, and so uh, how China presumes the loan to be repaid, I think now it's much more careful. So, and even it, it got to the government, central government, that it's really, uh, it's so important uh, for these loans to be repaid. At the same time, uh, China is the only one that uh, invests in these very risky countries. And it's always trial and error, especially for these large infrastructure projects. You never really know uh, whether they will be successful. So there is always some sort of risk. Because if you, if you look at more Western multilateral investment institutions, they put in place all these uh, uh, rules and regulations for repayment. Uh, and they do not invest uh, in countries, highly risky countries. China does it. And, uh, you never know what will be the result. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It's trial and error. It's very um, um, uh, uh, pragmatic I I at some level, the way it proceeds. There's another question, like China is said to have made a diplomatic nexus around India in the Western frontier through Pakistan, Iran, and even Afghanistan. How shall it affect its geopolitics of BRI in the region? Yeah, so this one also, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert of, uh, of that region. So I, I, okay. I'm, I'm, I think probably in, in the audience, you have people that are more, uh, more familiar and expert on, on these issues. Yes. Uh, the next is like due to bad economic condition, many countries may not be able to, may not take the loan under BRI because they will not have, they'll not be in position to pay back loan. Do you think so? This is a question which has come in the chat box. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's possibly the case that, that I discussed. So either Chinese bank will not be capable of giving money, but on the other hand, uh, uh, the, the countries will not be able to, to take loans. And we'll see what China will do. For sure, like, so the digital uh, Silk Road is less expensive uh, than, uh, uh, big uh, uh, infrastructure like roads or power plants. Uh, so maybe uh, it will, um, the Belt and Road Initiative will develop more in, in, that, uh, in that line uh, or it will change uh, uh, the priorities um, because if, if they're not uh, uh, able to, to, to take loans, uh, it's, it's, it's China, I think now it's becoming much more uh, prudent as I said, so it will, uh, it, it's not going to happen. 
the, the loan, yeah. Okay, there's one question on Southeast Asia. What are the prospects and status of BRI project in Southeast Asia? If you have more. Yeah. Uh, so Southeast Asia, it's, uh, um, I'm also not uh, that familiar with that, but uh, China, when, when I went uh, to, to Southeast Asia for a company, you really feel uh, that China is there. The way China is discussed is very different from uh, Europe or the US where like, you know, we can still have our own strategy. Uh, the power imbalance uh, is not uh, as much as, uh, as in uh, Southeast Asia. And most importantly, like China is really there. Uh, so there's uh, many projects that have been uh, uh, have been uh, uh, um, completed also as part of the Belt and Road Initiative that connects uh, uh, Southeast Asian countries with China uh, physically, and, and it's, it's a very important uh, uh, region for uh, for for China. Uh, but then again, there's uh, all, as as I discussed before, Laos uh, uh, that uh, we have similar problems also here. Uh, in terms of debt distress, debt, debt sustainability, maybe less so in uh, some of the countries with the politicization because uh, uh, they cannot really choose uh, some countries between uh, uh, China or the US because China is really uh, there. So it's really how to deal with it, uh, with this big presence, with this big elephant that, that, that is there. We've got one question from Facebook. There is like Susil Adhikari <coughs> writing, Post COVID-19, the powerful economies have witnessed around 25% drop in their GDP, while China is still enjoying a double digit growth rate. I don't think it's double digit, but do you think, yeah. uh, uh, do you like to elaborate slightly on this? So yeah, I don't, it's not double digit growth uh, at all, China. And as, as I showed in the slide before, uh, there was a, a huge drop uh, in, uh, in uh, GDP growth also in China. And the issue also with China is that uh, we don't uh, have uh, absolutely clear data. Uh, sometimes there is a sometimes lack of transparency. So uh, we don't know. Definitely, China seems to have recovered, and um, it has the capacity uh, from the central state to implement uh, uh, big uh, long-term uh, growth uh, uh, projects more so than maybe the U.S. Uh, or, or Europe depends. Uh, um, but um, it, both both countries, both the, the uh, powerful Western economies and uh, um, and China has uh, hugely suffered, and so we will see how they will uh, recover. What uh, uh, what tools they will use uh, uh, in the future? Yeah. There's another question on the chat box, which is there. You might be able to see. It's for everyone. Uh, what has China learned from the experiences of the last three years? on BRI projects? Yeah, so one thing that has learned, as I said, is to be more prudent, uh, that uh, uh, you need to put some sort of, uh, um, not conditions uh, of the level or conditionality is a level of like um, Western um, uh, multilateral invest investment banks, uh, uh, but you have to be more, more careful in giving money away and also another uh, thing that emerges very often from uh, uh, Chinese uh, um, uh, guidelines and, and, and policy uh, directives is that uh, uh, the Chinese enterprises have to uh, know better local circumstances, local regulations, local laws, and adapt to, to, to those. Uh, so I think there is more of a um, attempt to understand better uh, the local context uh, uh, to avoid failures, uh, uh, you know, because when 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 China goes goes out to invest, uh, often they just they, they used to rely on on local uh, local partners that might be corrupted and might uh, do a project that uh, the, um, that is a, the white elephant. There's no need, and so now I think they really try to negotiate better, know better the local situation, and put rules uh, uh, in place to make sure that. Uh, uh, things the projects are more uh, more sustainable in in in, in every respect. Uh, Similarly, there's one question: like many claims, China's BRI as a strategic, not only economic. How do you look at it? So you mean it's a probably geopolitical strategy? It's mm -hmm. not just yeah, for sure. I think it is. And uh, at the beginning, uh, it's um, even in Chinese, it was uh, the, the, it was uh, uh, discussed as a strategy. Then it was changed as a as an initiative uh, to really uh, decrease uh, 
the sense of threat that it engender, like among uh, uh, other countries. And uh, it is uh, economic, of course, but it, it's, uh, the economic is so tied also to the politics, both internal and uh, domestic and international. Um, and uh, uh, geopolitically, uh, I think China is trying to create uh, new partners, uh, not ally. It cannot really create probably now uh, the ally that uh, the US uh, had, uh, has, uh, but um, uh, new partners that might, uh, might help China in international fora. Uh, for instance, uh, in not criticizing China uh, behavior in the South China Sea or like uh, China human rights records. Uh, um, and so this is like, and also to, to balance probably partly against uh, uh, the US. Um, yeah, so definitely it's also geo, geo, geopolitical uh, strategy. It is a, a strategy of, of, of China. Uh, the other question is also similar, very similar, I think uh, it will be the similar answer to that. Like India sees the BRI as a strategic initiative rather than an economic. How does China see India's objection to BRI? Yeah, and also another aspect of the BRI is uh, the military aspects, uh, because uh, uh, now China has all these assets abroad that needs to protect. And so we saw a private, uh, um, private kind of military uh, going out to protect uh, uh, these these assets uh, of China, uh, we saw Djibouti uh, as a case of uh, uh, China military presence abroad, but also in many ports. Like Chinese presence is it's increasingly high, and uh, a, and there is definitely also potentially in the longer run a military component, a security component uh, to that. Uh, uh, and uh, how chi I mean, China and India are rival, and now, like you know, you even have this uh, uh, border uh, disputes. Uh, um, and um, but I, I, I'm not sure how China sees uh, India objection to the to the BRI. I mean, it tries to, of course, uh, calm every everybody down. I think it says that uh, uh, the BRI is an open initiative. It really uh, focuses on the openness of the BRI. So India also uh, should be part, the US should be part and, and shape it. Uh, but I don't think India really uh, believes that, uh, that much. Uh, we are running out of time. So let me put the last two questions. Uh, first is, do you think China has military objective as, uh, as well in BRI project uh, in the long run that has come in the chat box? Another on the Facebook, is there any nexus between corruption in China and death trap? For example, there are news of Chinese officials accepting or giving bribes for projects. Yeah, Great. yeah thank you. Very good question. So uh, China, I don't think it has a military long-term objective that goes with the BRI. But inevitably, BRI call uh, an investment, Chinese investment calls for security uh, and for probably mi partly militarization. And China uh, military has become, I think, one of the second largest. So it's, uh, it's really growing and it probably will start to deploy uh, abroad uh, with caution, of course, because it creates uh, um, much concern. So. Uh, you cannot just uh, uh, deploy your militaries uh, in, in, in your project uh, abroad. But definitely there would be a military security, because there is a security component to this project, that there will be probably a military uh, component uh, to it. And uh, uh, as for the other question, corruption and debt trap, for sure. We don't know. Uh, and it's impossible uh, to, to know what happened uh, uh, in the closed doors. And, and one of the big issues of this uh, um, uh, loan agreement is that they're not uh, published, they're not available, uh, most of them uh, on a, to, to the public. And so we don't know uh, what's happening. And uh, for sure the corruption on both sides, I think very often there's corruption both on a host country and also maybe Chinese official um, and, uh, you know, bribes and, and things like that. But uh, again, we now we have Xi Jinping anti-corruption campaign that uh, uh, might expand also to this uh, international uh, projects, uh, and uh, it's a, there is a big fight against uh, corruption. Um, but it, I think it's partly inevitable on, on both sides, and we just simply uh, cannot know and don't know. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Karai, for a very enlightening, comprehensive, and really interesting discussion. We had a very intensive discussion. 
Uh, thank you very much for your time. We hope to see you in real in Nepal or in China or in other parts of the world. We'd also like to thank all our participants for the interesting questions and time. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, Dr. Maria, and good night to everyone. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.